I don't know if you mentioned it. So that's a great question. Um, let's see where I have. <laughs> let me see if I even have it in my notes. I honestly don't think I have much in there. <laughs> the test right now is like on 15 pages of notebook paper. I write it out by hand first, which seems way old school, but it's actually a lot faster than trying to draw the structures with software first and then deciding I want to change my mind. Um, I don't know if I put anything. Oh, okay. So right now I do have something in there about MO theory, but it's more like, I'm giving you a filled in MO diagram and then asking you questions about it, which, um, which level is the LUMO, which is the HOMO, how many nodes does the sixth orbital have, um, things like that. So if it, if it makes the cut, it would be like the, I want to say quick, but isn't quite the right word, the low point questions where it would be kind of like multiple choice, um, low point questions. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. I was, okay. yeah, thank you. I was just wondering if like we had to, uh, you know, like fill in where like it overlaps and then, you know, label the LUMO and the stuff like that. But if it's just kind of like identifying regions and stuff, then okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I did want to actually start by talking about the test a little bit. Um, so the tests, well, let's see, back up a second. We're going to finish chapter 18 today. Mon Monday will be a study day. So I don't have like anything official, formal planned for those days. It's more of a hang out and ask questions kind of day. So you are more than welcome to just kind of come in, come into lecture and sit in lecture and work on a worksheet work on studying and just hear everybody else's questions because you know sometimes that can help. Um, or you can come with a bunch of questions planned. Um, you can ask me to do questions from the worksheets or the, te uh, the or the, um, the, the textbook or you know if you find something online, I will be more than happy to work those out for you. And then Wednesday's the test. So the way we're doing the test is during class time, during Zoom, camera's on. Um, your camera, let me, I'm gonna grab my camera. So your camera needs to be like here-ish. So I should be able to see you and your workstation. You can see my many screens I always have open. I feel like this pandemic has made me way more high tech than I've ever been. Um, and I do have Professor Wada's videos in our class information module for his examples of how he set it up. Um, I have had a couple students tell me that they've done this in their other classes and it worked well. <laughs> yes, I'm totally a gamer. <laughs> um, and it's worked well. It's definitely working better than Proctorio and respondus and all those horrible software that nobody likes. Um, but here's how the actual test day will go. So our class officially starts at two. So I'm going to ask you to log into Zoom a few minutes early just to make sure that you're set up and ready to go. Our class is an hour and 25 minutes. The test is going to be one hour. I'm going to write it with that in mind. So it is going to be shorter than what my test would normally be. Um, and definitely shorter than last semester. I gave those of you guys that had me last semester, I gave you, <laughs> no, it is not open note. So in front of you, when you're taking your test, it should be the test and something to write with. Um, you really don't, you won't need a calculator. You don't really need anything else. Um, but the class is a hundred, not hundred, the class is an hour and 25 minutes. The test is an hour. So what we're going to use <laughs> the time for is when class starts at two, I will um, make the test available on Canvas. So for those first 10 minutes of class, you are downloading the test and printing it out. 
You can't start taking it during that time, but you are more than welcome to read it. So read through it, come up with a game plan of what you want to start first or what you are leaving till the end. Check those point values to help you make those decisions. And then we will all start the test at 2 10 ish. Um, and then you'll have an hour. And then the last 10 minutes of class are for you to take your pictures and upload it. And then we have, you know, kind of five minutes of wiggle room in there. Um, if you don't have a printer, you can do your pet test on paper. Um, not on a tablet, though, because obviously you would have the tablet at your fingertips and the internet at your fingertips. So it has to be done on paper, whether you're printing out the test or just doing it on notebook paper. Um, trying to think if there was anything else the other class asked. If you are a DSPS student, I'm going to reach out to you individually and tell you what my plan is. And you'll tell me if you think that'll work for you. Um, if you are a DSPS student and you haven't gotten me your accommodation stuff, your accommodation paperwork, um, get it to me soon and we can, we can come up with a plan. Questions? So the, you, you're releasing the exam at two, correct? And then we, okay. Yeah. Um, so I already have on Canvas, I already have like a test two. I have all the tests listed on there as assignments already. They just don't have anything in them yet. Um, so I will add it to that and I will, right now it's technically available because I just created assignment holder spaces. So I'll make it unavailable and then release it, make it available at two. That is a great question. So there will not be synthesis problems that include stuff from last semester. Um, my tests are usually four sections. Multi-step syntheses, what I like to call box problems. So it's finishing a reaction, whether that means you're filling in the reactant, the starting material or the product, you're filling in kind of the empty, the empty space, the empty box uh, mechanisms. And then the fourth part is um, usually like definition type questions, but how that, how I ask that is usually through multiple choice, true, false, matching those kinds of questions. Um, and that's also where nomenclature falls in. Now, because this test is shorter than what I normally do, that last category I mentioned is probably the category that's going to take a hit in terms of cutting stuff out. Um, then those kinds of questions, not that you're answering them directly, but you need to know the answers to that type of question in order to do the reaction. So the concepts are throughout the test. Uh, it does just include these three chapters. So 16, 17, and 18. So that means the only reactions that are on the test, the only mechanisms that are on the test, the only, the only reactions that you need to use for the multi-step synthesis are within those chapters. Any practice exams? Um, I have not posted any yet. Um, so I will post a study guide and then I will look to see if I have an old exam that I can post as a practice exam. And I, I probably do. The only reason I kind of phrase that weird is I've taught out of a, a couple different books. This is my 14th year teaching. <laughs> so I have a lot of old exams, but because they're from different books or I might have divided up the chapters differently, I might need to kind of like Frankenstein together a, a practice test, but I, I will, um, I'll come up with something to post for you guys. Professor, so are yeah. most points on the test allocated towards the multi-step synthesis? Um, that is a good question. I'm writing myself a note to do a practice test. Um, let me see what I have in my notes so far. I try and kind of divide it, but so...
professor? Yeah. Um, kind of piggybacking on that question. Mm -hmm. um, I was just, because you said earlier, like a couple minutes ago, like how it was just relegated to those three uh, chapters. Mm -hmm. So it would kind of be like, we start with toluene and then it'll be like three different pathways with, you know, a sulfo, sulfone group or nit uh, nitrate or something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the multi-step synthesis stuff is actually what we're going to talk about today during lecture. So we really haven't, um, we haven't kind of made that jump to the multi-step stuff. So to answer the question about points though, so right now the way I have it set up is that the, oh, where is my multi-step? I thought I was going to answer this question and then I realized I was missing a page. Um, right now the box problems I have as the highest number of points and then the mechanisms and the multi-step are about equal. Um, when I readjust things that that will probably stay about the same. Um, the box problems are usually just more questions because it's essentially just kind of like one step, one step reaction. So you're, there's a bunch on a page at the same time, but we'll see. I got to figure out how to make it a little bit shorter than what I normally do. And I'll put everything I said about like the schedule um, and the info for that. I'll put it up in a Canvas announcement. Um, either tomorrow or Friday, uh, just so all that information's in one spot. And I'll link the page to Professor Wada's videos. And I will um, link the study guide and the practice test um, at the same time as well. So you just kind of have everything in, in one, one location to find. Any other test questions before we, we start today? We still have a lab next week. Um, We'll s hmm. I got to pull up the schedule. I don't remember. Uh, next week. Yes. So on Monday, there is a lab. We're doing experiment 8-5. So we'll talk about that during, during lab time. Um, it is going to be our formal report. So it's not due for one, two. You have three and a half weeks to write it. So if you want to ignore that experiment and not do it that week, I totally understand. You obviously have plenty of time and that is a benefit of doing labs virtually is you can do them whenever you want. Um, but I will talk about it next week and talk about writing a formal report. If you had me in the spring, it's the same process. And if you haven't had me, it's probably a lot different than what you've done in other classes. I make you use an American Chemical Society journal template. So it looks pretty cool when they're done. Um, and then after the test though, there's nothing scheduled for lab time. I don't have anything scheduled during lab time after any of our exams. Um, it's just not a, a good time. Your brain's a little busy and fried and I know you wouldn't do well in whatever we, activity we had planned. So yeah, anything else? I, I have a question regarding the chapter 18 worksheet, but I feel, can I just ask that after class? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, professor, um, mm -hmm. I was just wondering if um, there was like a, uh, like a reaction summary, like, uh, like, what do you call it? Like kind of like a cheat sheet, like to study from yet, or is that, you know, something being made or. So I will make. I will give you a study guide, like telling you which reactions you need to know. But in all honesty, you're going to need to know every reaction from the chapters. Um, chapter 17, I don't think had any reactions in it, did it? Oh, yeah, it had reactions in it. I'm lying. Um, oh, yeah, it was those. <laughs> Sorry, I'm looking back at my notes now and remembering. Um, so, yes, you assume that every reaction that we have talked about will show up on the test. Not every mechanism though. Um, in terms of a reaction summary, there, there are really good ones at the end of each chapter. That's where I'm getting my reaction numbers from. So I don't provide you with one. I'll give you a list of what you need to know, but the actual reaction reagents, starting materials, products, all that will be from 
from those reaction summaries in the book. Okay, so like if we flip to the like the last few pages in the Klein textbook, there'll be like a couple of pages dedicated to like a summary? Yes. Okay. So, let's see, I'm pulling up chapter 18 right now. So in chapter 18, it's page 833. It looks like that. And so it just, it starts with benzene and it shows you everything that benzene can make. Um, it's a, I think that, I think that that's one of the things that this textbook does really well is it does have those nice um, summaries at the end. And they, just in case you're looking for it, they technically call there's a review of reactions. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, last scheduling thing. Oh, page 833. 833. Um, last scheduling thing. I'm looking back at my notes. Um, on October 12th, so two weeks from today, Professor, Professor Wada is visiting our class. Um, I am getting evaluated this semester um, to get tenure. So you guys should have already received links to fill out the online evaluation forms. Um, so Professor Watt is going to come and evaluate our class. I will introduce. So it's, it's weird to be evaluated in online setting. Normally it would be obvious because he'd be in our classroom and I would introduce him and let you know why he's there. So I'll do the same thing on that day, but I don't know if you'll even notice that he's here. I don't know if he'll have his camera on or if he'll participate or talk at all, but if you know him at all, you know that he's a funny guy and he might speak up just to be silly. So we will see. But just so you know that he's coming. <laughs> Thank you. It is kind of weird coming from a school where I was at for 12 years and had tenure for a long time and now doing it again. But, eh, you know, you do what you do. <laughs> okay, let's get this going. Man, it is so hot today. Oh, what happened to our weather in the last couple days? Okay. We are going to take the next step with our reaction. So what that means is last Monday, we added a bunch of stuff to a benzene ring. Or last Wednesday, excuse me. This past Monday, we said, well, what if we want to add a second thing to the ring? And so we went through and labeled our substituents as activators, deactivators, electron donators, electron withdrawers, and most importantly, what we're going to use today as orthopara directors or meta directors. So we've gotten up to the point where we can add two things onto the ring. Now we're going to say, well, what if we want to add a third and a fourth and so on? So we're going to look at a couple different scenarios. The first one here is when our substituents play nice together. So here's what I mean by that. We have our methyl group up here and our methyl group is an ortho para director. And on the bottom there, we have a nitro group and our nitro group is a meta director. So as we are looking at what's on the ring and we're deciding where the new substituent is gonna go, the first thing that we want to do is we're, we have to decide if the current substituents are ortho para or meta directors. And from that, we're going to look at which, which carbons are they directing the new substituent to go to. So the methyl says that the new substituent should go there or there, so to the two ortho positions. It can't go para to the methyl because that position's already taken. So we don't mark that one. The nitro group says that the new substituent should go there or there. It should go meta to the nitro group. So in this scenario, our two substituents are voting 
for the same position. So our new substituent is going to be ortho to our methyl group and meta, oh geez, meta to our nitro group. So in this scenario, both of our substituents are voting for the same positions. They're pushing for the same positions. So they're working together. Of course, that's not always the case. So our first step is going to be decide, are they ortho, para, or meta directors? So now we have an alcohol group. This is an ortho para director. It's going to direct our new substituent to the ortho positions. The para is already filled. And we have a methyl, also an ortho para director. So it's going to direct the new substituent to the ortho positions. Again, the para is already filled. So there's a vote for each carbon. How we decide who wins is right here. The stronger activator wins. We had that table that showed all of the different activators and deactivators, and it was in order. It was in order for an important reason. The strong activators were at the very top, and then the moderate activators, and then the weak activators, weak deactivators, moderate deactivators, and then the strong deactivators. So when this says that the stronger activator wins, another way to say that is the higher up on that table or the higher up on this list it's going to win. So stronger activator wins or higher on table slash list. So in this case, our ortho para director, our alcohol is a strong activator and our methyl group is a weak activator. Alcohols are stronger, so that means that the alcohol's vote counts for more. So our NO2 group is going to add ortho to the alcohol because it is a strong activator. Questions about, about that so far? So I'm going to add to our, our steps up here. We're going to look for the strongest activator. So that first step when we're comparing ortho, para, and meta, if they agree with each other, then we don't have to move on to the second step. If they don't agree with each other, then we move on to that second step to see who is the strongest activator. There's one more thing. Oh, oh, that is such a great question. That is exactly where we're headed. <laughs> so the next thing we do have to take into account is the bulkiness. So we've compared ortho, para, and meta directors. We've looked for the strongest activator. The next thing we have to consider is sterics. Now this can come into play for two reasons. The examples that are on this slide, we have an isopropyl group and a methyl group. Those are both weak activators. So neither one of them is a stronger activator than the other. So they have an equal amount of voting power. So then we're looking at sterics. The other way that this could come into play is when we have three substituents on the ring and now we're kind of voting at random places 
there might be two places that are equally voted for. The one that would, where the new substituent will add is the one that's least sterically hindered or the most available. So let's look at the options we have on this slide here. So we have our isopropyl group and our major product for this one is when it adds para. Uh, when we talked about this last time, we said that if we have a methyl group, the major will be ortho or methyl sized. And if we have something bigger than a methyl, then the major product would be para. So most things will be bigger than a methyl. Um, so in this case, our isopropyl's major product will have our new substituent para. For that second one, I'm gonna erase those, I'll only erase one of those blue circles anyways. Our methyl group votes for the ortho position that para is filled. The isopropyl also votes for the ortho positions and its para is also filled. The way we decide then is we move on to the sterics option and the major product will have our new substituent ortho to the smaller substituent. So the less sterically hindered option. And then same, same substituents in this last one, but this is our first example where our two substituents aren't para to each other. So because there's not symmetry, it, it changes things. So again, isopropyl, we get a vote for each ortho and a vote for the para. And methyl, a vote for each ortho and a vote for the para. So notice that each of the carbons, with the exception of that empty one there, each of them have two votes. So based off of our ortho para directors, all of those have been voted for equally. Our major product is going to be the one that puts that new substituent next to the methyl. And then the minor product is next to the isopropyl. And then over here in this sad little parentheses where it says not observed, that's putting the new substituent between the two existing substituents. So because that one is the most sterically hindered, it's just not gonna happen. Questions about any of that? All right, we are gonna decide then where some new substituents are gonna add. So notice for all of these, we haven't really talked about what the new substituent is. So questions like this, we're talking about where will a new substituent add? It doesn't matter if it's a bromine, a methyl, a nitro, it just matters that, it just matters what's already on the ring to help make that ring more active at specific locations. All right, we have a nitro group. Is our nitro group an ortho para director or a meta director? Meta. Mm -hmm. So one of the meta positions is already filled. So it's gonna direct right there. And that means this guy's also a meta director. And same story, one meta position's filled, but there's our other one. And what about our methyl group, ortho para or meta? Ortho para. Excellent. So both orthos are filled. So we're going para. So this is one of those nice scenarios where everybody gets along and we know exactly where that new substituent's going to add. All right, let's see if the next one plays as nice. All right, we have this ester group here. 
is that ester group going to be an ortho para director or a meta director ortho para it's a meta director if if we flipped it around oh that was a horrible ring if we flipped it around so that the single bonded oxygen was attached to the ring, then it would be ortho para because it can be an electron donator. But because the carbonyl is what's next to the ring, that makes it an electron withdrawing group and that's going to make it a meta director. So there's a couple things, esters specifically, that will fit into more than one of those categories based on how we form that bond. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right, I'm gonna erase this guy up here then. And that arrow, just because it's in the way. All right, so meta director. Um, so ortho meta, ortho meta, which means our other ester will definitely be in the same category. The methyl group is in the way for one of those. So there's our other meta position. And then we already know our methyl is an ortho para director. So there's one ortho, the other ortho's filled, and there's our para. Um, Where is our new substituent going to add? Position one, two, or three? I agree. It's going to add to carbon number two. So the first thing we want to look at is which one of these is a stronger activator. And the esters are both deactivators. So because our methyl is in the activating category, it's the strongest activator on the ring. So we know that the vote from the methyl is more important. So already we know that this position's out because the methyl didn't vote for it. When we look at the other two positions, carbons one and two, we base our, deci our decision off of sterics. And carbon one is more sterically hindered because it's in between those two substituents. So we're gonna pick carbon number two because it is less sterically hindered. All right, what about, whoops, oh, there we go. What about our next one? So we've got a methyl. We know our methyls are ortho paras. So one ortho is filled. There's the other ortho and the para. Ortho para. Again, one ortho is filled. There's the other ortho and para. Um, what about this CF3? Is that an ortho para director or a meta director? Meta. meta. <laughs> In stereo, I like it. Meta. Meta. So they're definitely playing along. They're voting for the same positions. Does it matter which one we add to? You're right, it doesn't matter. Because there's symmetry in this structure, it wouldn't matter. Adding to either one would give us the exact same product. All right, last one on this page. Let's start with the ones we've talked about. Ortho para, that ortho's filled, that ortho's filled, so there's my para. Ortho para. What's our alcohol group? Is that an ortho para director or meta? Ortho para. 
Excellent. So ortho, the other ortho and the para are filled. And then what's bromine? Is bromine ortho para or meta? Is it also ortho para? It is ortho para. So the halogens can be a little bit tricky because they are deactivators, but they fall into the ortho para category. Um, so there's our ortho, the other ortho is filled, and the para is filled. So we have two carbons that have an equal number of votes. Where will our new substituent add? Carbon one or carbon two? Two. It is going to add to two. Why is it going to add to carbon number two? Uh, the alcohol is a stronger activator. Perfect. So it's going to add to carbon number two because this guy is our strongest activator on the ring. If BR was a strong deactivator, would that change anything? Nope. Because when we look at when we look at this list right here, right, the strongest activators have the highest influence, and the strongest deactivators have the least amount of influence. Okay. So we're going up that list every time. So we're not looking for which one's the strongest. We're looking for which one's the strongest activator. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, any other questions on, on that structure before we change slides? Okay, so right now what we've done is we kind of are starting with something really bulky and we're trying to add on that fourth or fifth substituent. Um, what we're going to do now though is start with either something smaller or something with just without any substituents on it, excuse me, and talk about how to do that multi-step synthesis or how to create that larger structure. Um, a big part of this is going to be looking at what order do we add our substituents onto the ring, and we might want to add a substituent to a spot that is what would be more of a minor product. So for example, in the reaction up here at the top, we have a tert butyl group, or which is an ortho para director, but it's a big bulky group. So we know that the major product should be the para. And so what this is saying is, well, what if we want the bromine to actually be in the ortho position. How can we force it to go into that ortho position, even though that's not the major product? And so here's how we do that. We're going to use what's called a blocking group. Uh, in previous chapters, we used what's called a protecting group. And we'll do that again in some upcoming chapters. But that's the idea here is we are hiding a certain carbon. We're making it unavailable so that we can then add the bromine to that ortho position because the para won't be available anymore. And then we can take that blocking group back off. Now what's even nicer about this reaction though is it's something we already know. We know how to add a sulfone group to the ring. Looking to see what reaction number that was. Number four. So in reaction number four, we added a sulfone group to the ring. And then right after that, we talked about how to take that sulfone group back off the ring. So this reaction did not get its own number. I just said that it was the reverse of number four. But we know how to add this to the ring and remove it from the ring. So the sulfone group itself isn't, isn't special. We're not adding it because it is a sulfone group. We're adding it because we know how to remove it really easily. So here's how we do the reaction. 
we start with reaction number four, we add that sulfone group. Because we have a tert butyl group on the ring, as an ortho para director, a bulky ortho para director, that sulfone group is going to add ortho, or I'm sorry, <laughs> that sulfone group is going to add para. I said that with such confidence too. Um, so our sulfone group is now in the para position. So when we add our bromine substituent, and this was reaction number one, when we add our bromine substituent, the tert butyl group is going to push it to that ortho position because the para position is no longer available. Our sulfone group is a meta director, so that works in our favor because both of them are pushing for that same position, meta to the sulfone, ortho to the tert butyl. So we've added our bromine into that position we want and then we can use the dilute sulfuric acid, so that's the reverse of reaction number four, to take that sulfone group back off. And now we have our product without any side products, and it's not just the minor product, it's the only product for the reaction. So it's a nice way to kind of force the reagents to do what we want them to do. So here is that reaction summary we were talking about earlier. Um, the reason why we are looking at it here though is it's kind of divided into two halves. Up here at the top are the six things that we know how to add to a ring. Bromine, chlorine, nitro, sulfone, alkyl groups, and ketones. We know how to add those directly to the ring. And then down here, the substituents that are in blue, we can create those by converting something we've added to the ring. So our nitro group can become an amine. Our methyl group can become a trihalide or a carboxylic acid. And both of these are from chapter 17, reactions eight and nine from chapter 17. And then we also know how to reduce our ketone down to an alkyl and this last reaction, this, well, well, not quite that one. Let's make that arrow a little different. This reaction right here, this one is a really good one to create that primary alkane because our first one that we did was just adding an alkyl group to the chain can go through carbocation rearrangements. So this is a way to do it without having those rearrangements. All right, one more thing we gotta talk about on this slide though, before we move on. Our nitro group is a meta director. When we go through this reaction, we've created an ortho para director. Our methyl group is an ortho para director. And when we add halogens to it, it's now a meta director or when we turn it into a carboxylic acid, it's now a meta director. And our ketone is a meta director. And when we reduce it down, it's now an ortho para director. I bring this up and I want you to see this, this pattern because when we are adding these to the ring or when they're added to the ring and we're converting them to something else, the order is going to make a really big deal because we are changing them from being ortho para to meta or vice versa. And so how the other substituents get added onto that ring is going to be affected by when you make those transformations. So we are gonna practice this. Oh, we gotta talk about some, some rules first and then we'll practice it. Um, we've actually talked about all these rules before when we talked about the specific reactions. So this is a friendly reminder before we start doing some of the problems. But starting up here, we can't do a nitration reaction if there's already an amino group on the ring. So if there's an amine group on the ring, we can't add a nitro group to the ring. 
the bottom bullet point tells us that we can't do a friedel crafts reaction. So this was our alkylation and acylation if there's a moderate or strong deactivator on the ring. So this rule, this limitation is definitely going to come up a lot more than the one above it, more than that nitration one. Um, so it's something we have to keep, keep in mind. Um, and let me, I was gonna put reaction numbers up here as well. So our acylation is number six and our alkylation is number five and our nitration is number seven. So if we have moderate or strong deactivators on the ring, we can't do the friedel crafts reactions. So we got a bunch of things we got to kind of keep straight in our brains as we do this. So we're going to do three of them. Um, if you have the slides up on your screen or you printed them out, I took the three examples and put them on their own slides because when I did this with my morning class, it was just way too crowded. So I broke them up into their own. So this is essentially a multi-step synthesis problem. We are starting with a benzene. And the question is, how do we make this, this product that's on the screen? Here's how we're going to approach this. We're going to start by looking at everything that's on the ring and deciding if it's an ortho para or meta director. So what about our ketone there? Is that an ortho para or meta director? Meta. Mm -hmm. And what about our bromine? Ortho para. Very good. And our isopropyl group. Ortho para or meta? Ortho, ortho para. Very good. All right. Once we know that information, then we have to think about do we know how to add all of these things directly to the ring? So is it part of that top half of the summary? Is it one of those red sub substituents? Or do we have to go through one of our transformations to make one of those blue substituents? So in this case, we know how to add all of those things directly to the ring. So we, based off of that, this should be a three-step multi-step reaction. Add the ketone, add the bromine, add the isopropyl. The next thing we're looking at is the rules or the limitations. We do have two different friedel crafts reactions on, on our reaction. Or we have two different substituents that need to be added with a friedel crafts reaction. So this one's friedel crafts and this one's friedel crafts Ketones and alkyl groups. The, do we have any substituents on the ring that are moderate or strong deactivators? No. The ketone is. So because this guy is a moderate deactivator, that tells us that we have to add the isopropyl group before we add the ketone. So right there, we have some sense of order. We need to add the ketone after that isopropyl. So what do we add first though? Are we gonna add the isopropyl first or the bromine first or the ketone first? What should go onto our ring first? Would it be the isopropyl? I agree. We're going to add that one on first. I'm going to put our reagents over here. So there's my isopropyl. I have a, a leaving group, a chlorine attached where I want it to attach to the ring. And then I'm going to use 
ALCL3 as my Lewis acid catalyst. I could have also used iron chloride. Our isopropyl group is an ortho para director. So what are we going to add second, the ketone or the bromine? The, the ketone? Oh, was that a vote for each? <laughs> So I'm going to go with ketone on this one. And the reason why I'm going to go with ketone is our isopropyl group is an ortho para director. The bromine's ortho, the ketone is para, but because it's kind of bulky, the major product will be the para. And our bromine is ortho to that isopropyl, but it's also meta to our meta director. And so this way, everyone's kind of voting in the same direction. So to add that ketone, that did not look like a chlorine, to add that ketone, uh, oh, just two carbons. So I have a chlorine attached to my ketone. Make sure that you have the right number of carbons. So we only needed two carbons. And then our third step will be to add that bromine. So the bromine is meta to our ketone, our meta director, and ortho to our isopropyl, our ortho director. So it kind of fits into place when we do it that way. Now, if we did add the bromine second, the bromine is a ortho para director. Um, and our isopropyl is also an ortho para director. So they would be directing towards different carbons. The isopropyl is a stronger activator. So it has more, more pull or more votes towards where the new substituent would add. But it would probably give us more side products or minor products than doing it in this order. Um, so usually with deciding the order of these, there's usually one great answer and then a few okay answers. There's usually one that will give you the exact product you want without any side products and then doing it in a slightly different order will probably give you some minor products or side products on top of the one you want. Um, questions about this one before we work on the next one. Um, I have a question about the ketone being moderately deactivating. Uh-huh. So um, why does that mean that the isopropyl should be added first? So that's not, oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to answer it in a wrong way. Um, when we have a moderate or strong deactivator on the ring, because it's making the benzene ring less reactive in general, it's harder to do a reaction. And the Friedel-Crafts reactions are a little bit temperamental. They're just difficult to do. And so if there's something on the ring that is making the reaction more difficult, like a moderate or a strong deactivator, then the Friedel-Crafts reactions just don't work. And so because of that, because there is a moderate deactivator on the spring, we need to do the Friedel-Crafts reaction before that moderate deactivator gets added to the ring. Okay, that totally makes sense. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else on that guy? Um, this is just kind of like a lab question, but if we were <laughs> to do this in lab, um, would we use this way or is this kind of just like, to learn these kinds of reactions. No, you would totally do it this way. Um, if we tried to, if we tried to like mix them together in a different order, we would get, we would get them in different positions, or we'd get a mixture of products. Um, so we are using, and actually on this last one right here, I have it as iron um, bromide, but it could have also been aluminum, not aluminum chloride, aluminum bromide. Um, so all of these we could. Honestly, if we were doing the lab, we would probably have bromines in place of all of my chlorines because that would make for less errors as well, using all the same catalyst all the way through. 
Um, because it's all the same catalyst, it could probably be all done in the same reaction container and you would just slowly add in the reagent you want, let it react, slowly add in the next reagent, let it react, and you wouldn't have to do anything in between them since it's all the same rea all the same um, extra reagent, that same Lewis acid catalyst. Okay, because I remember in like OCHEM, like some of the some of the reactions just kind of seemed like a lot of things could go wrong and there's just so many like reagents and it kind of seemed inefficient. There's definitely always things that can go wrong. Um, yeah, but this is this is how you actually do it. Yeah. Anything else on this one? So is the reason why the the ethyl group went first was because it was the it was the only one that was an activator. Um, you, so I'm I'm hesitating answering your question because it feels like this is trying to turn into like a general rule. Um, I guess I could ask like, what's the general rule of thumb as to like figure out how to go first with it. So there's not one, which is why I'm not answering your question quite right. So the isopropyl goes first. And so if I were just to look at this structure, um, what I see is our, trying to find a color I haven't used, Let's go back to red. So we have this isopropyl group. We know it's an ortho para director. And so when I look at what's already on the ring, the bromine is ortho to it and the ketone is para to it. So in my head, I can think, well, if I add that isopropyl first, it can direct those new substituents to the right location. If we added the bromine first, it's an ortho para director. So yeah, the isopropyl is ortho to it, but the ketone is meta to it. So that doesn't quite match. And so I, I would approach it to kind of find a starting point that way. Just look at one of them and look at how the other ones are related to it in terms of their positioning around the ring. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, it does. It does take some practice. This is definitely something you want to do practice problems out of the book with. Um, in past classes, students usually like these multi-step synthesis problems better than other chapters <laughs> because there is less room for interpretation. You're not trying to build like a big long chain. You're adding something onto that one ring. So there's not an infinite ways to do it. There's three things. So you can really only add them in so many different orders. Um, and so really you could, if you're having trouble starting it, the solution could be just to start, just to pick one. It might not be right, but it will at least get something on the ring. You start with the bromine and then you add your second thing. And if it doesn't work, then you cross it out and now you add the ketone first and see what happens. Um, so if kind of thinking about it and analyzing it isn't your strong suit, if that's what's not going to help, then maybe just working the problem out is what's going to help. So kind of a couple different approaches you can take. All right, second one. We have our ortho para director bromine. We have a ortho para director chlorine. And we have a sulfone group. Um, I can't remember if we've talked about these. You, yeah, is our sulfone group an ortho para director or a meta director? Mm -hmm. 
So, we know how to add all three of those things directly onto the ring. They're not on this slide. We don't have any stipulations with them. We're not doing any friedel crafts reactions and we're not adding a nitro group. So we can completely ignore the limitations that are on this slide. So that tells me that I only need to do three reactions. Which one are we gonna add first? The bromine? Yeah, I think adding the bromine first is going to work well. So Br2. ALBR3 or FEBR3. So if we're adding bromine first, who gets to be added second? The cell phone group. Perfect. So our bromine's an ortho pair director, but it's a pretty big atom. So we're going to add our second group into that para position. So we're going to add our fumine H2SO4. And then that leaves the chlorine for number three. And it works out because where chlorine is located, it's ortho to our ortho para director and it's meta to our meta director. Questions about that one? All right, we have one more. The last one's definitely the hardest. So we have an amine. Is our amine an ortho para director or a meta director? Ortho para. Mm -hmm. And we have our bromine, and we know our bromine is also ortho para. And we have a propyl group. And our propyl group is also ortho para. Do we know how to add all of those things directly onto the ring? Not the amino group? Yeah, so instead of just that amine, we know how to turn a nitro group into an amine group. A nitro group is a meta director though. So that's gonna affect our ordering. That propyl group down there, we know how to add a carbon chain to the ring, but if we're trying to add a primary carbon chain, we need to do it in two steps. We're actually going to add this as a ketone first, and then reduce that ketone down so that we don't have any rearrangements, any carbocation shifts, and that ketone is a meta director. And so again, we have to be concerned about our ordering. Um, that ketone is a friedel crafts reaction. and change colors. So this is a friedel crafts reaction. So this has to be done bef well, let's word that different. Uh, this has to be done without the nitro group on the ring. I was gonna say before the nitro group, but it could be done either before the nitro groups on the ring or after the nitro group gets turned into the amine. It just can't have that nitro group that strong deactivator on the ring. So just looking at the information we have, we're going to have five reactions. We're going to 
add a nitro group to the ring, turn it into an amine, add the bromine to the ring, add the ketone to the ring, and then turn the ketone into an alkyl. So we know already we need to do five reactions. Of course, the question then is, what order are we gonna do this in? So there's my benzene ring. What should we do first? Could we do the nitro group and then add the bromine before converting it to the amine? We can try that. So add the nitro group first. So HNO3, H2SO4. So our nitro group is a meta director. So then adding that bromine. What are we gonna do third? Convert it to NH2. Okay, um, so to convert it over to our NH2, uh, we need zinc and, and HCl, um, and we can use zinc or iron for that. Let's try that again. HCl, it still looks weird, but it looks better than the other one did. Um, so zinc and HCl in the first step, and then base in the second step. So now we have, and we have two ortho para directors. So now we really only have one option left. We'll add that ketone in step. Oh, so this was three. This is four. So this is going to work because our amine is an ortho para director and our bromine is an ortho para director. So they're, they're going towards the same three carbons. We know the one between them is not gonna happen. Um, so the other two is going to be based off of sterics. The, the location where we want our where we want our ketone to go is probably not going to be the major product for this because a nitrogen is smaller than a bromine. So up here would be more likely to be our major product. So how could we force that ketone to go there? At a blocking group? Yeah, and so I'm actually going to kind of cheat here and just put this all on one line. I'm gonna put fuming H2SO4, that adds the blocking group to the that one position. Step two is to add our ketone, and then step three down here would be the dilute H2SO4 because that takes that blocking group off. And I'm honestly doing this just because I don't have a whole lot of space. And then our last step is the reduction reaction. I'm trying to decide which way my arrow is going to go here. I go this way to get our final product. Um, so this is a zinc mercury alloy with some acid and some heat, and it will reduce that ketone down. Um, this is not the order that I did in my own notes, though. I'm going to put my numbers up here in red, just so you know what order I did them in. I did the ketone first converted it to the alkane, which is an ortho para director, 
added the nitro group into that para position, added the bromine because it's ortho to the alkane, meta to the nitro, and then converted it to an amine. If you did it the way we did in black though, with that blocking group, you would get full points. There's nothing wrong with that. So if you uh, just kind of jump in and get started and realize that there's a spot that might not quite work, use that blocking group to your advantage. It kind of, it's probably going to allow you to turn a pathway that might not be great into one that completely works. Any questions about this one? All right, we have two more reactions to talk about. Um, what we've done so far have been electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions. Our benzene ring has been our nucleophile. It's reached out and done a nucleophilic attack on the electrophile we're adding. The last two reactions we're going to look at are nucleophilic aromatic substitution reactions. So aromatic, we're still dealing with benzene. Substitution, we're going to take something off the ring and replace it with something else. Nucleophilic, we're now adding a nucleophile to the ring and the ring is going to be our electrophile. So we've switched up the roles. Um, in order to do this reaction, there's three things that have to occur. So down here in that NAS rules section. Oh, and this is reaction number 11, by the way. So the first thing is, is that there has to be a strong deactivator on the ring. And so we have an NO2 group. Um, we've actually only talked about three different strong deactivators. We have our nitrogen with the positive charge. We have our carbon with the three halogens and we have the NO2. Now all three of those are technically strong deactivators, but the NO2 is the only one that can participate in resonance because the nitrogen and the carbon of the other two are both sp3 hybridized. So really we could even make this more specific and say that the ring has to have an NO2 group on it. The second thing is that the ring has to have a good leaving group. And so for our example up here, our leaving group is the bromine. And really, this means it's going to be a bromine or a chlorine. And then the last rule says that these two things, this strong deactivator and this good leaving group have to be ortho or para to each other. So in our example, they're para. What we're reacting this with is a strong nucleophile and really the best way to, um, to identify that is the negative charge. Uh, so we know that that sodium is just there to balance the charge. Potassium does the same thing. So when we see the sodium, just ignore it. We know that that really just means a negative hydroxide. So we need a negatively charged nucleophile. We need some heat. And then in that second step, we need some acid. And in our product, the leaving group is gone. So leaving, let's write that differently. Leaving group leaves, nucleophile adds. Reaction-wise, what we're seeing happen is pretty simple. It's a lot like a lot of substitution reactions we've seen before. Leaving group leaves nucleophile bonds. We're going to look at the mechanism, um, but I'm also going to tell you before we even dive into this mechanism that it's not going to be on the test. There, all the reactions we talked about on last Wednesday, uh, they all had very similar mechanisms. That's definitely the focus of this chapter one of those will be on the test. So for this one, I do want to point out some differences. I want to talk about it a little bit, but we just won't talk about it as in detail. This does start with a nucleophilic attack, but there's our nucleophile. 
and it's attacking the carbon where the leaving group is attached. And then the pi electrons are going on to the carbon of the ring and creating a carb anion. Still resonant stabilized. So as that carb anion moves around the ring, notice which carbons it's hitting. It's on the ortho and the para carbons. So we want our NO2 group in either the ortho or the para position so that it can help out with resonance. It gives us that fourth resonance contributor because it's also participating. And then in that last step, we have the loss of the leaving group. So the chlorine leaves, the rest of the electrons go back to where they were so that we can restore aromaticity and we get our final product. Our last reaction, number 12, is essentially a variation of reaction number 11. We still have a leaving group attached to the ring, but we don't have that strong deactivator anymore. Because we don't have that strong deactivator anymore, look at what we do have to have. Lots of heat. So we do still have our strong nucleophile, our negatively charged nucleophile, and lots of heat. That's uh, not an official symbol, but I think it gets the point across there. And then in that second step, we still have acid. So the result is essentially the same. We're losing our leaving group. We're replacing it with our nucleophile. Um, the reason why we have these last two reactions is we only talked about how to add six things to the ring and how to convert a couple of those to something else. Oh, there's a lot of other things that we might want to have on the ring. And so this is a way to do it. We can add a chlorine to the ring. We know how to do that. We know what a bunch of negatively charged nucleophiles are. And so we can do this substitution reaction without having to add that substituent directly to the ring. We can just substitute it in. Um, this is a different mechanism though, and we'll look at it on the next slide. But what happens when we do it is here's our leaving group. When that new nucleophile adds, it can add to the same position that the chlorine was in or the one right next door, that vicinal carbon. So we're going to talk about why in our mechanism here. We start by using that strong nucleophile to take off the hydrogen that is next door to that leaving group. This is where it gets weird. Loss of a leaving group, so chlorine takes off. That carbon ion, though, look what happens to those electrons. Look at this crazy structure. Those electrons turn into a triple bond on that ring. It is called a benzyne. So ine, because it's an alkyne. Uh, this is not a happy structure. Triple bonded carbons are sp hybridized. They want to be 180 degrees. So this is a highly reactive structure. There's our nucleophile again. It's doing a nucleophilic attack. So it could attack either one of those sp carbons, either one of those triple bonded carbons. And that's why we can get a mixture of products. We create that carb anion again. And then the acid in that second step is used to add on that proton. So if there's nothing else on the ring, you don't really notice. But if we start with something else on the ring, then we will end up with our new substituent in the exact same position as the original leaving group or right next door to that original substituent. Um, so just something to keep in mind as you're drawing out products that there are two possible products for this guy. Questions about that mechanism at all? Or the reaction? Do we need to memorize this mechanism? 
no, this one won't be on the test either. The last section in this chapter is kind of a weird one. Um, it's really helping you figure out which of these three reaction pathways are happening. This electrophilic aromatic substitution, this is what we spent the most time on. This is almost all the reactions we talked about. The SNAR, that's the nucleophilic one, that's reaction number 11. And this is the elimination addition is reaction number 12. Um, so the idea here is that it's asking you questions to figure out which pathway it's going to go down. I don't know if this is actually useful or helpful, but this is how they are suggesting you approach it. Um, in reality, you just need to know your reagents. So if you know your reagents, you'll know what's going to happen regardless of which pathway it's taking. So I honestly don't think it's the most useful section, which is why it's one slide and the last slide but it is in there, it might be helpful to you. So this is it, this is our last, our last slide for this chapter. Um, on the schedule for lab today is the worksheet for chapter 18. Um, the worksheet for chapter 17 is due today. And the experiment, um, the first experiment I have it, it's all graded, read your comments, look at your score. You can still turn in the second experiment, so it's 3-4, using the feedback I gave you. So if you already turned in that experiment, you can go back and make some corrections and resubmit it. You won't get marked down any points. Um, if you haven't submitted it yet, submit it by tonight at 11.59 p.m. and it will still count. You won't lose any points for it being late. I gave you a couple extra days because I wanted to make sure that I got your feedback for the first one to you so that you could use that on this second one. Question? Yeah, uh, for chapter 18, actually, before we go to that, could, I'm still a little bit confused on, um, on the synthesis strategies. Mm -hmm. So, Let's just say you you just pick one, not randomly, but you know you you take an educated guess. Uh, is it? Are you saying that because let's just say you were picking the. Let's just go with the, I don't know what it, I don't know what it's called, but it's the carbonyl group that has um, four carbons attached to it. Okay, the ketone group. Right. So because that one's meta then do you just say that the one that's the following reactants are going to go in the meta position is that how you're yeah so if we added that ketone first nothing is meta to that ketone so that tells me that i would need to switch it over into the alkyl group first because the alkyl group is an ortho para director and the other two substituents are ortho and para to it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Okay, and then how did you know that you, that you should do the NO2 to NH2? Like you should focus on the para position rather than the ortho position. So because, it's, because that propyl group is larger than a methyl, that tells me that the major product would actually be the para position. So even though it's an ortho para director, the major location would be para because of steric. So I would add the position or the substituent that's in the para position first. So I would add that NO2 group because that will give me the major product in the right location. Okay. All right, I, th I think I'll just like do some practice problems, but I, th I, I think I get the gist of it. Okay. For chapter 18, uh, so, so the worksheet, or is it chapter, I think it was chapter 17, sorry. Um, the very bottom where it says like use principles of aromaticity to predict properties of molecules. Mm -hmm. 
I don't have. I guess I could open it up if you want me to. If, if that's. Do you want me to just pull it up or is that a. No, I can open it up. Okay. I might actually, I think I have it open already because somebody was asking me earlier. Let's see. Um, yeah, this guy. Okay, which one? So let's just take the the first one. So question one. How is it? Is it always that? Because I recognize that there was a um, there was sort of like a pattern where if, if it was more stable, it'd be more acidic. Yeah. That, so thinking all the way back to Ario, which I think was like chapter two. Um, the more stable a conjugate base, the more, the stronger the acid it came from. So in order to, in order to answer this question of which one is more acidic, we would want to look at their conjugate bases. And for letter B, if we take off, I don't think I can draw on this, but let me see. No, I don't have fancy enough Adobe. Um, if we take off that hydrogen on letter B, it's, well, for either one, if we take off the hydrogen, it's going to leave a, a carbon ion in its place. So a carbon, lone pair, negative charge. Mm -hmm. For letter B, that means that we now have a ring with three electron pairs, two from the pi bonds and one from the lone pair. Because there's now three, an odd number, it is aromatic. And so that tells me that letter B is going to be more willing to give up its hydrogen or more acidic because it's going to have a very stable conjugate base. For letter A, when it gives up its hydrogen and now we have a lone pair plus the pi bond, we have two, that's going to make it anti-aromatic, which is very unstable. So we're looking kind of the question behind the question here is which one will have a more stable conjugate base? Okay. And then for question four, like 15 C number four, that one had, was asking for a stronger Lewis acid. So it's kind of the same. I mean, we're definitely still dealing with aromaticity here. Um, our boron only has three bonds going to it. So it has an empty p orbital that can participate in resonance. And so letter B has three pi bonds in it, which makes it aromatic. Letter A only has two pi bonds. So when it says, which one would you expect to be a stronger Lewis acid? It's asking which, which boron is going to bond more strongly. And our answer will be A, because if letter B bonds to something else, it's going to lose its aromatic structure. But letter A wasn't aromatic to start with, so it doesn't have to worry about losing its aromaticity. It doesn't have to um, overcome that loss of stability, whereas letter B would. So all of these are dealing with either becoming aromatic and becoming more stable or trying to avoid losing aromaticity and losing that stability. Does that make sense? A little bit. These ones were more like probably the things that I struggled the most on out of the worksheet. Yeah, and these ones are definitely looking, I mean, they're not just stuff from this chapter, but it's, it's uh, definitely using concepts from previous chapters, but concepts that kind of follow us, like especially acid-based stuff. We always talk about acid-based stuff. So it's essentially a way to say that aromaticity is extra stable, extra good, and structures want to be aromatic. So if that means that they're giving up a hydrogen to become aromatic, or holding on to that hydrogen to stay aromatic, 
that's essentially what you're looking for. So in any of these questions, figure out if they are aromatic the way they are, or if whatever change it's talking about, so being acidic or basic, so losing a hydrogen, gaining a hydrogen, would that make it, would that change make it aromatic or make it lose its aromaticity? And so that will kind of help you on the right path with those. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anything else for me? Um, I just have like a quick question with the lab that's due today. Yeah. Just with um, the mechanism, it's like a really quick question. Um, the dotted lines, is that like a, f uh, that has to be a part of the mechanism to kind of show, no? No, not at all. So we normally just do, do the arrows, the, um, cause the, it's the Deals Alder one today, isn't it? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so the Deals Alder one's a little bit different because it almost feels like you're kind of drawing arrows out into, out into space. Exactly. But yeah, you just kind of want to draw them so that they're close to the carbon that it's bonding to, but you don't have to have the dashed lines now. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome. And oh, also with that same mechanism, the shape that we have that came straight from the lab, it looks like a trans shape, you know, with the two methyls going like one up, one down. Um, but most of the dials like look um, kind of like cis, you know, oh. like double bond and then the one going up, one going down, like one. So, let's see, I'm going to draw what I think you're talking about. Awesome. Thank you. I'm not excited, but I no, feel like it okay. should matter because it's cis or trans, but this is one of the, the challenges of doing our online classes. So you mean this one, right? Yeah. Well, actually the one in the, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. That one. Okay. So, and, and then versus the one that's laying down almost once it's been react Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So going around this bond, it has free rotation. So in order to do the Diels Alder reaction, it has to be in the trans, or excuse me, it has to be in the cis. So we, we call this S trans and S cis. Um, they're not stuck in either the trans or the cis configuration because they do have that rotation. So the S stands for single, as in the single bond. Um, so yeah, and normally we would draw it as, as the trans because it is more stable that way. There's less steric hindrance. But in order to do the reaction, it has to rotate into the cis. So for mechanism purposes, we do need to draw it as the cis in order to show the mechanism happening correctly. But when you're okay. approaching this, you might draw it out like this, just because that's the way that it, we would normally draw it. I see. Awesome. Good. Yeah, that's the one I was kind of using for the mechanism. But I was like, wait, what if it's not even okay because it's cis rather than trans? Okay. <laughs> Perfect. That answers my question. <laughs> you know, one last question on that same lab. Mm -hmm. You know how we talked about that one of them is like a, a sharing for the H um, NMR. One of them was like sharing. Oh, the, yeah. Yeah. For when I was documenting how many H's are in each, I kind of want to put for that same bond that there is two. I kind of put a dashes in like I'm already counting it as one of them. Because then if I add another, for example, one of them had two H's. If I add that one again, it's going to come up to like 14 H's rather than 12 even though I know there's only 12, but one counts double. I didn't know if just putting a dash in one of the H's is okay. Like if it's, if I'm doing it, like if one of it's F and then I'm putting that another one is F2 and it has oh, two H's So the way that you it. can do it is you can just like write it as F1 and F2. And so that just means that it's the two different hydrogens at location F. Okay. No, yeah, I did do that. But the thing is when it asks for how many H's are in each in the uh -huh. column, should I, for example, for F1 and F2, well, let's say on that carbon, there's two H's, two hydrogens. Should I put on F1, one hydrogen and then F2, one hydrogen to kind of share both yeah. of them? Yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. Just wanted to make sure. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye.